let me just start by saying this. It is completely understandable that you want to escape sometimes. Completely understandable. This world is kind of a mess. And, and it's more of a mess for some people than others. The systems that we have in place and just the, the way that things work is, is a better fit for some humans than others. And, and the worse of a fit it is for you, the more you want to get away from it. I can't think of anything more understandable than that. I, I really can't. It's so understandable to me that I, I I did it for a long time, a long time. And I remember the exact moment when I started. I remember it was in school, as I suspect it probably was for most of you. And I was just miserable at school. And I, I kind of made this filter, if it makes sense. I, I made everything kind of like an anime version of like medieval times, if that makes sense. And I saw my whole life and everything I was doing through this filter. And it was a visual filter. It had a soundtrack. I mean, it just, it changed everything. And it suddenly made everything bearable. It made it tolerable. And I remember thinking like, I, I figured it out. I've been, I've been so unhappy with so many parts of life for so long. And I have felt like I was born into the wrong country or the wrong timeline or on the wrong planet. And I've made this shift in my mind and now I fit. Now I belong in this world that I've created with this filter that I see the world through. And, and it worked really well for a while. But I started to notice that there were some drawbacks to it. And, and eventually I started to notice that those drawbacks were severe. And now that I'm a mental health professional, I've also noticed those drawbacks in other people who have used similar strategies and spending an excessive amount of time in a fantasy world, whether that's in your own mind or whether that's through like novels or, or anime or TV shows or video games actually produces, I've seen this over and over and over again, it produces a mix of symptoms that resemble depression, anxiety, an inattentive type ADHD, or what most people would call ADD. And it's a very specific cluster of those symptoms. The real double whammy is that a lot of people who use fantasy worlds as an escape actually already have one or more of those conditions in the first place. And so the side effects, for lack of a better term, created by this excess amount of time in a fantasy world exacerbate the symptoms that are already there to begin with and make everything that much worse and that much harder to deal with. In other words, what I'm trying to communicate to you in this introduction is that I know that this fantasy world you have might feel like the only thing that's helping you get by. And it may have been that for a period of your life, that actually was true. But I also know that at least for me and for many other people I've worked with, there comes a point where it actually does more harm than good and where it might even become the reason that you are barely getting by even with it. I really hope that the tone of this video is compassionate and empathetic rather than like aggressive or, or confrontational or judgmental because this is a very delicate topic. This is a very sensitive topic. And I just wanna make sure that you know that I get that. Hopefully I've communicated that to you. So that being said, I want to explore the costs of spending too much time in your fantasy world. And when I say too much time, like, I don't get to decide that for you, okay? You, you know your life and I don't. You have to be the one to decide where that line is and what constitutes crossing it or not. I'll tell you how I figured out where that line was for me, but that's my story and not yours. And you may come to a different conclusion about your life than I did about mine, and that's okay. The first cost of spending too much time in your fantasy world is a pretty obvious one, but I'm still going to say it and explore it a little bit. Your life is never going to measure up to it. It's it's not because you can craft something or or enter something that someone has already crafted, you know, through media, something idealized, something that either never has problems or never has conflict, or if those problems or conflict do exist, they are always resolved. They always have a happy ending. They always have a satisfactory conclusion. Real life cannot offer that to you. 
And you know that. And that's always going to be, at least in the back of your mind, if not in the front of it, the forefront of it, when you're trying to engage with your real life. Your real life, if you have a vibrant and robust fantasy world that you escape into, will always kind of feel like the sad version of the thing that you want it to be. But in order for your real life to feel like the sad version of anything, there has to be something to compare it to. You know, I like when I see people talk about, you know, like the, this existence sucks or my life sucks. Well, there has to be something then that you're comparing it to and saying this thing does not measure up to this thing. And the better, the higher the quality of the point of comparison you're using to judge your life against, the worse your actual life will feel in comparison. I know I use the word comparison like three times in that sentence. I'm sorry. I was trying to think of synonyms, but it's hard to think of synonyms and also make your core point at the same time. Your life will never measure up to the fantasy world. And, and, and the more time you spend in your fantasy world, the worse your life will feel in comparison. And you'll probably notice this the most when you, for lack of a better term, come back. When you have to stop consuming the media or when you're forced to like really fully re-enter your life, it, it's, a, it, it's like waking up from a really, really nice dream and realizing you have to go to work, right? It's just this instant sensation of unpleasantness and dissatisfaction. And it's because of that comparison. It's because you're comparing something real to something idealized and fantastical. And that's always going to be an unfavorable comparison for the real thing, because the real thing is flawed and unpredictable and problematic. And, and I know that's why you escape, but that's also why the more you escape, the lower your satisfaction will be with your actual life. At least that's one of the reasons it's not the only one. The second reason that spending too much time in your fantasy world can decrease your enjoyment of your actual life is that it worsens your relationships. And it does that, unfortunately, in a few different ways. One is essentially just an extension of what we talked about before. Your relationships in the fantasy world can be perfect. They can be idealized. Or the relationships you see between other people in fictional media, they, they, they are written to, to some certain conclusion. They are predetermined. They are predestined. And they are written out in a way that supports this conclusion. Who would want to have a relationship with a real flawed human being when you can feel like you have a relationship with an ideal perfect partner? It, it, it's going to decrease your desire to engage in relationships because everyone around you is going to feel unpredictable and, and annoying and weird and flawed. Here, Okay. Here's the thing, though, is so are you like, I'm not saying you're weird. I don't know you, but you are imperfect as well. And, and that's part of what makes those relationships work. It, it will make everyone in your life a disappointment to you, essentially. Every friend, every family member, every partner will be a disappointment because in your head, you'll be thinking, why aren't you more like XYZ character? I wish I had this kind of relationship. I wish you were more like this person. You will never be happy with anyone. They will never be as good as what's in your head because they are real. That's it. I, I know I'm being redundant, but I, I need you to hear this because it is incredibly important. Something else I need you to hear, and, and this, this may be the hardest thing to hear of this entire video, but, but you, you need to hear it. Spending too much time in fantasy worlds also worsens your relationship because it worsens your social skills. Because when you're imagining or envisioning social interactions, they are scripted and you can control them and you can command the other people to respond the way you want them to. Or again, if it's fictional media, every interaction that these people have is written to end in some certain way that's already been determined by the creators. Everything's already figured out. There's no actual dynamic adaptation that you have to do in your own mind, because if you make a misstep, you can just change it. You can modify it. You can adjust it. And so you may be having vibrant relationships and in-depth conversations in your mind, but those skills that you use to have those con conversations and those relationships in your mind, they don't 
translate real well to the real world. And so your social skills end up not developing or potentially even atrophying because you aren't using the actual human to human social skills. And that also includes things like your tone of voice, your body language, all your nonverbals. You don't have to use those in your mind. I mean, you might imagine using them. You might imagine those things, but you're not actually physically enacting them. And so when the time comes for you to have an actual like phone or text or face-to-face -face interaction with another human being, you're going to be rusty. You're not, you're, you're not going to be great at it. And that's also going to make it less fun because it's it's not fun to do things we aren't good at. When you feel awkward and uncomfortable and unsure of yourself socially, it's not fun to socialize. And so it becomes one of those vicious circles, one of those self-perpetuating patterns where you end up retreating even further into this fantasy world because your real life interactions are not going the way you want them to, partly because those are real flawed human beings, and partly because you're not developing those skills. You're, you're not great at it. And again, please don't hear shame in that. This has happened to me. Like I, my social skills were years behind my chronological age for a long time. My wife might tell you that they still are, but um, I'll leave that to her. I had a lot of ground to make up. And this is a huge part of why those skills do not translate. They are different enough that being a, a suave, charming, likable person in your own mind through scripted or, or mm -hmm. fantastical interactions doesn't actually make you that person in real life. In fact, it makes you like less of that person. It, it does. I'm sorry, but it's true. The third reason spending too much time in your fantasy world can harm you is that you're growing the wrong thing. We all, there, there, there are certain universal human struggles that we all face. And I think, I think the most universal is resource management. It's different from one person to the next, but we all have limited amounts of time, limited amounts of energy, and limited amounts of attention. Nobody has an infinite supply of these things. And at the end of the day, what every single one of us is trying to do is allocate those in the way that best supports the quality of life that we're trying to build. Anytime you allocate those resources to the fantasy world, you're not allocating them to the real world, or at least not very much. I had, it's not exactly an epiphany because it feels really obvious, but I had an epiphany about this um, when the very first Sims game came out. Uh, my neighbor had it and I thought it looked pretty fun. So I got my own copy and I, I ended up like making my Sims have a great life. They were like going to the gym regularly and they had awesome jobs and, you know, they had finished school and all this stuff and they had this beautiful, neatly organized, well-maintained house. And then I had this almost like out of body experience where I saw myself playing the game and I realized I'm unemployed. I'm out of shape. My room is a disaster. I made this great life for these fictional characters. And now I'm trying to like essentially live it through them, but my life sucks and I'm doing absolutely nothing to better that. And although I could not have made my own life like theirs in like a week, which is about how long it took me there. I didn't even try. I, I, I spent all the, I spent all these resources building the lives of my fictional characters rather than just building my actual life and making it more satisfactory. And yeah, it's, it's not instant gratification. I know that's, that's the big difference is you don't get instant gratification very often in real life, but every day you have a limited amount of these resources. And every time you're allocating them to growing an imagined version of yourself or a virtual character in like an MMO or something like that, that's time you're not growing your actual self. You're going to have to choose. You're going to have some ratio of this to this. And if you're spending a lot or even the majority of your time growing an avatar or a virtual version of yourself and not your real self, your life is going to end up unsatisfactory. And, and yet again, and, and we're going to come back to the same conclusion again and again and again, because it's that important. The more unsatisfactory your own life becomes, the greater your desire will be to retreat into the fantasy world. And so it becomes a self-perpetuating problem because the thing you're using to cope with your dissatisfaction increases your dissatisfaction. And you can only trick yourself for so long. I, I know that the fantasy world can be very, very rewarding. I know from personal experience, but 
at some point, you're going to realize I haven't done much with my actual life. And you're probably not going to feel good about that revelation the day that it hits. Again, take it from me. I had that day. It sucked. The fifth way that excess time in the fantasy world can harm you is that it actually decreases your cognitive performance. This one is well studied and well researched. There is a direct correlation between what's defined as maladaptive daydreaming, which essentially is the same thing we're talking about today, and decreased cognitive performance as measured by things like sustained attention span, memory, processing speed. It probably goes back to a similar principle. No one actually knows the exact mechanisms of this. We can only theorize, right? But it's probably a similar phenomenon to what we talked about in um, the communication skills and interpersonal skills part of this video, where you're only doing these things in your mind. So you're like, you're simulating things, but you aren't actually doing these things. You know, you might, you might have a fantasy version of yourself who is amazing at taxes. I, I don't know why that was my example. Probably no one in the history of fantasy worlds has chosen that. I don't know where that came from, but I said it, so I'm going to commit to it as a metaphor. And and maybe you imagine this this fantasy version of yourself like being an incredibly successful accountant and just everyone's like in awe of their tax ability and the the more I say this the more ridiculous it sounds, but I'm still committed to the metaphor. But none of that actually makes you good at doing taxes, right? So you can you can get, if you're really good at imagining, if you're a very visual, a very imaginative person, you can experience some of the emotions that go along with that hypothetical scenario, but it doesn't actually change your ability, right? You're not using, other than imagination itself, you aren't really using your cognitive abilities when you're in the fantasy world. So you aren't growing your cognitive abilities. You aren't developing your cognitive abilities because they develop through use. They develop through practice. And what you're practicing is escaping rather than using them. So they aren't developing as quickly or as thoroughly or as effectively as they, as they otherwise could. And so again, when you go to try to go to school, try to try to go to work, try, try to do your taxes, you might really struggle because your brain is atrophying. Your, your real world skills and ability to engage with the flawed, frustrating, screwed up world that we have is declining because you aren't using them. You have to use them or you lose them. And, and that's what happens. Sixth problem with excess time in the fantasy world. I've kind of alluded to this one already, but it's a skill. Imagination is a skill. Visualizing is a skill. You, your world will probably become more detailed and more robust and, and more um, stimulating over time as you continue to practice engaging in it. And what that's going to do is it's going to decrease your connection to the real world. It's sort of like a slider, you know, like a like a brightness slider on your phone. The farther you go in one direction, the farther you get from the other direction. And the your actual real life can take on a surreal feeling. If you haven't experienced it, that probably sounds super weird. But if you have experienced it, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You can get to a point where your fantasy world feels more real than the real world. And, and it can be pleasant. It can be very pleasant, but it can also be really dangerous because what that leaves you vulnerable to are things like dissociation, derealization, depersonalization, the parts of your brain that serve as anchors to the here and now, that serve as um, like, like beacons basically for your actual physical life that really exists here, they start to weaken if they're not used consistently over time. And so your connection to the real world, this is scary and disturbing, I know, but it starts to fade. And your actual life, can start to feel kind of fake. It can start to feel like it's not like it's not really happening. It can feel less real in the fantasy world. It can feel more like a movie you're watching or a book you're reading. And although it can be pleasant, it can also be absolutely terrifying. Especially when you get to the point where you realize I don't want to do it anymore because you can't necessarily just instantly snap out of it and make yourself go back. You have to practice getting back into the real world. You have to practice orienting to present space and time because those skills are not are are not well practiced in you and it can feel like you're losing your mind like it can it can really feel like you're losing your grip on reality and the 
the pleasantness of that sensation can vary from one moment to the next. When, when you realize I have an actual life right here in front of me that I want to try engaging, like re-engaging with, I want to get back into this life. And you realize like, I don't know how, I don't know the entry or re-entry point into my actual physical, tangible life. I don't know how to make my brain get there. It's terrifying. It's really, really scary. And, and I, I, I know this sounds like a cautionary tale because it is, because I'm hoping that you, you really take that seriously. The longer you do this and the more you do it, the harder it will be to get back from it if you decide that you want to. And the last reason that I'm going to share today anyway, this might be a two-parter because I think this is a really important topic, but the last reason I'm going to share with you today that I want you to exercise caution in escaping into fantasy worlds is that it strengthens the escape route that exists in your brain. What I mean by that is it, you don't really get a chance to experience the real world if you're always ducking out of it as soon as it becomes unpleasant. You don't really know what your life is like. It's, I'm going to share something really embarrassing with you guys. Like, I know I do that regularly on here. It seems this one's worse than normal though. Until I met my wife, every single person that I dated, I always had a backup plan. Like I always had someone else I was talking to who I knew, like, if this doesn't work out, I'll, I'll just do this instead. I'll, I'll just, I'll just date this person. It was totally an insecurity thing. For some reason, every single relationship I got into, I thought, this is the last woman who's ever going to be interested in me. This is my last chance. Like, it's it's this or nothing. Why I'm thinking those things when I'm 16 years old, I don't completely know, but I was. That was that was my worldview. And so every relationship when I'd get into it instantly felt like life or death, all or nothing. And I'd get super like clingy and possessive and weird. And I knew that wasn't okay. And the only thing that ever made me feel better was to like have a backup plan, have a plan B of like, hey, if I find myself single in the future, like we should date. And I literally always had that every single relationship until I met my wife. The cost of that, well, there's, there's a lot, but one of the biggest costs of that is that you never then fully engage with or commit to the thing you're in when you always have an escape plan. And so anytime I would face any adversity or discomfort or challenge in a dating relationship, I'd just be like, see ya, you know, I'd, I'm not up for this. There's no reason for me to even try because I'll just try with this person instead and maybe this thing won't happen. Um, I didn't watch a lot of Friends when I was younger, but I do remember there's an episode of Friends where Chandler and Monica have their first fight. And after the fight's over, Chandler basically says like, well, that was cool. Like, like this was a good relationship. Sorry, it didn't work out. And she's like, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm paraphrasing. It's been a long time. And he says something about like, well, we had a fight. So like, we're broken up now, right? And apparently that was how every relationship he was in up until then had ended. Well, that was, that was me. As soon as anything didn't feel good, I would just bail. Like I was, I was, I was not a good person in my adolescence. Um, but, but it actually cost me a lot as well because I, I didn't learn any relationship skills whatsoever other than to just leave if things get hard. And that's what you're training your brain to do with not a relationship specific, specifically, but with your entire life and everything in it. If every time you face adversity or discomfort or unpleasantness, you escape, you retreat, you're training yourself to do that. You're training yourself to have no distress tolerance skills whatsoever. And there, there's no way you're going to be able to live a satisfactory life in the real world without distress tolerance skills, because the real world is a really distressing place and, and you're going to need them. So this was a lot, I know. And, and if the content of this video landed for you, I want to, again, just state my understanding that these may have been very, very hard to hear. And I say them with love and compassion as someone who at least to some degree has been there and understands how hard it is to let go of these things. I told you at the beginning that I was not going to tell you where your line is, but I would tell you where I have determined my line is. And my line is any. I'm, I'm completely serious when I say that. And, and that's a decision I made over time gradually. I didn't, I didn't go cold turkey on this. I went from like the majority, you know, there was, there was many stages 
between the period of time when I spent the majority of my life in a fantasy world versus trying to never do it now. Um, and, you know, those might have been like 90% to 70% to 50%. I, I, did, I didn't actually think of it numerically, so I couldn't tell you exactly what those stages looked like. But I have gotten to the point in my life at 40 years old where I, I have determined I only want to be here because I don't want to waste any of this. I have so many regrets already about things I missed out on, things I didn't do, people I've let down or disappointed not only because of this, but in large part because of this. And I don't think I can live with any more of that than what I already have. So I have made the decision to fully commit to my real life, to have no escape, to have no backup plan, and to just do this. And at first it was awful. It felt so unpleasant. I was so dissatisfied with everything around me and everything that I had but I made the decision to cope with that dissatisfaction a different way. I made the decision to cope with that dis dissatisfaction by trying to change what I was dissatisfied with rather than trying to escape from it. It takes about a thousand times longer because, you know, you can't just flip a switch. You can't just, oh, I'm happy with my body now. Oh, I'm mentally healthy. I have good relationships. I have good sleep hygiene. You have to work on them. You have to build them up. They can take years, like each of those things I just said. And that's not even the full list could take years. So have realistic expectations, but I want to be able to say I gave it my all. I want to be able to say I did everything I could to make the actual life I was given the best one that it could be. And for me, there was only one way I could do that. And that was to eventually basically say, I have to be sober. That That's how I treat it. I treat it like it's a substance because for me personally, it was more addictive than any substance I ever tried. Like not even close. This was this was 10 times more damaging to me than any drug ever could have been. So you have to decide where that line is for you. That's where it is for me. I'm not the boss of you, but I hope that you really think about some of the things that I've shared with you today. Um, because I know this is a personal topic, if you want to discuss any of this with me on, on Instagram or something like that, please feel free to send me a message. Uh, I'm, I'm open to talking about this on a personal level. So um, just let me know. Okay. Good luck. Take care. I'll talk to you later.